really in large part what we're seeing is the acceleration of a fundamental uh, shift that has been, I think, anticipated for uh, years, if not decades, which is China's economic transition um, from a relatively low uh, value added uh, manufacturing uh, centric economy and export oriented economy that uh, was really dependent on both inflows of foreign direct investment as well as state mobilized uh, domestic investment to an economy that looks much more like a higher income uh, country and certainly is a higher income country, but that's really more focused on domestic consumer um, spending. You know, that's a that's a shift that um, has been decades in the making, uh, much anticipated, I think, not only uh, within China, but around the world as well. Um, and I think there's substantial consensus among economists that that's really kind of where China needs to be headed, both for its own sake, as well as um, the sake of the world economy. Um, I think what we've kind of seen, and, and Trump has been part of this, um, is the acceleration of that uh, through three main events. First, the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, second, uh, the Trump administration uh, tariffs and a sort of aggressive uh, uh, trade policy. And then uh, most recently, uh, the pandemic. So I would say that uh, the Trump administration has had a marked uh, uh, effect on U.S.-China relations, uh, most visibly in terms of the um, uh, the trade tariffs, uh, as well as kind of associated China policy uh, crackdowns uh, more more widely. Uh, but really, I think it's it's kind of part and parcel of this very long term um, structural shift. Um, and and I think for the most part that shift. Uh, would have been inevitable under any circumstance. It's just a number of factors, Trump's election included, accelerated that. If we remember um, when the trade war started, I think it was about early 2018. You know, it was supposed to be a trade negotiation, but it ended up being um, a lot of kind of firing of terrorists. Uh, from the U.S. against China. You know, China also did retaliate a little bit. Um, but then that didn't end. It was followed quite uh, quickly with um, technology, like banning um, of Huawei. So it was not only a trade war, it was a tech war. With all that, um, China, um, if you think about from Xi's, uh, President Xi's uh, perspective, um, he, was, he must be under really big pressure because um, he was supposed to manage the most important relationship. And um, it was really going south. And then you had the pandemic. Um, so with the pandemic, uh, with the war, the trade war, I think he must feel a lot of pressure internally. Um, but then fast forward um, to today, um, China uh, has been perceived as coming out uh, quick um, in recovering from the pandemic. The economy starting to recover, and with all the financial economic hit from the US, plus the big, if everyone remember, the big um, a few geopolitical um, kind of fight uh, over Hong Kong in particular, basically China imposed a national security law in Hong Kong. Um, basically the Hong Kong Policy Act was revised and, you know, Trump said, you know, Hong Kong is now, you know, China, mainland PRC sees Hong Kong as part of China. But then now when I look at what's going on, um, not a whole lot has happened to China. Like it's still going okay. Hong Kong seems to be okay. No big economic collapse. Um, and to the point where China actually just recently uh, struck a deal with uh, 14 other countries, uh, 10 Asian, uh, Asian countries to Southeast Asian countries. Um, plus Japan, Korea, um, uh, Australia. Uh, despite all the uh, trade war, tech war, um, China were able to do, thing, do these things in its own economic uh, arena. Um, so it seems that it's really in a strong position going into the next few months during this political um, presidential transitions in the U.S. I think under a Biden administration, um, you will certainly see uh, a shift in rhetoric on multilateral uh, involvement. Um, and you'll see some su uh, substantive shifts in a few places, again, like the WHO certainly rejoining, restoring U.S. funding, same with the Paris Agreement. Um, you'll see those kinds of shifts, but, uh, but I think it's going to be uh, relatively uh, uh, muted. And I think 
uh, competition with China will be a theme that cuts across uh, multilateral activity in a way uh, that it, it, it did not previously. Um, but I will say, you know, if you kind of look back at the history um, of these institutions, they were for the most part constructed largely, you know, kind of with uh, US leadership um, and largely with the express purpose of promoting uh, a kind of liberal democratic uh, world order in response to uh, the challenge of the Soviet Union. So if you will, there are a couple of levels on which the multilateral system is actually built for an environment of great power uh, ideological competition. Uh, and maybe the return of that um, will kind of allow some of these institutions at least to kind of find new purpose um, and perhaps, I hope, undergird a new level of, uh, uh, of support from countries like the US as well as Japan and uh, the European countries um, to properly fund these organizations uh, and to politically support and empower them.